Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman. It's so good having you with us today. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. And today we have a very exceptional guest with us. We're very honored to have Dr. Stephen Austin with us. It's great to have you here today. Thank I you, Don. I feel like it's, uh, it's almost amazing that we got you out of the dirt to come and be on the show. It's oh, great to have you. It's good to be here to share these things with you. We're excited to have you. And today we're going to talk about a, a term that I'm not sure I ever heard until you used it, continental sprint. Can you tell us what that is? Um, you've heard of continental drift? Yes, sir. Uh, there was a German meteorologist almost exactly 100 years ago who published a book on the origin of continents and ocean basins. His name was Alfred Wegener, the German meteorologist. It was the book on continental drift. And um, he believed that the ocean basins formed by a supercontinent to split apart, moving very slowly over hundreds of millions of years. So that would be part of the whole uniformitarianism, that everything had to have slowly and gradually at a uniform pace. Yeah, and Alfred Wegener's theory of continental drift was rejected by geologic establishment because he was a meteorologist and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he had this idea that the ocean basins formed very slowly by the continents moving apart. He got the idea from a Christian creation catastrophist oh. named Antonio Snyder. And so we want to go back and honor a, uh, a pioneer of science uh, and we we can call his theory continental sprint. And Very his good. idea was that continents didn't drift slowly. They, they move fast at a walking pace, something like that. So sprint. It's going to be a fascinating show to talk about that. Now, for our scientists out there, uh, what's CPT? CPT is the other name for this. Uh, uh, we call it continental sprint, but it's really catastrophic plate tectonics. If you, if you want to talk to scientists, you got to use science terms. Yes, sir. And uh, so catastrophic plate tectonics. And plate tectonics is the idea that the Earth has been deformed, the Earth's crust, on the, uh, uh, the boundaries of uh, giant plates. And these plates crashing against one another, sliding by one another, creeping underneath one another, those are the, the processes that form mountains and ocean basins and, and ultimately the continents and the seafloor. Well now, we're going to talk today about what the world was like after the continental sprint. That's, Is that that's right? right. Uh, well, continental sprint dis didn't all of a sudden stop. There's some leftover effects sure. and after effects. And tectonics continued, the, pro the process that deformed the earth uh, continued into the present day. And of course we have earthquakes and we have volcanoes today and things that remind us of tectonics, but nothing like the, the tectonics of the past. We have volcanoes uh, to uh, talk about. Uh, we have the sedimentary process, what was going on during the flood compared to what was going on now uh, after the flood. And erosion, and uh, 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 erosion continued and uh, some big canyons and things opened up. And then, of course, the Earth cooled off, and so we had global cooling since the uh, 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 continental sprint. And so we, can, we, we have a lot to talk about here. We sure do. And uh, I'm going to be interested to hear about global cooling because we hear a lot about global warming. Uh, I've drawn a graph here showing the intensity on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis from the end of the flood to the present. Okay. And as we draw this graph, the graph of everything declines with time. And it's an exponential curve, if you know what I mean. Uh, in other words, things uh, dropped off very rapidly to begin with and now have kind of flattened out in sure. the present day. And so uh, the geologic intensity of tectonics, of volcanoes, of earthquakes, just all geologic process seems to follow the curve like this. So we had catastrophic plate tectonics, or continental sprint back there, uh, the time of the flood, and then uh, the, the world has recovered. We went through an ice age, a big uh, ice advance and an ice age. Ice age was a natural consequence of the flood, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, let's talk about the tectonics associated with the uh, slowing the, uh, uh, of continental sprint. Now, horizontal plate tectonics was occurring during Noah's flood. 
and thousands of kilometers of displacement of seafloor and continental plates occurred. Today, that process has largely stopped. Uh, we're seeing some leftover residuals from it, but what happened is vertical tectonics took over. And that's what I'm trying to show here on this graphic, is the edges of a continent uh, were a collision belt between ocean floor and, uh, and the continental mass. What's happened since this flood? We've had a lot of vertical tectonics up and down, unloading and loading due to movement of things ar around, underplating where things have been shoved under and things are rising up. And so up and down motions largely dominate in uh, the present world. Okay. And, and uh, so vertical tectonics and what's called isostasy, that's the principle of uh, uh, equal pressures at depth. And it, it creates this uh, vertical tectonic world that we largely live in. And of course, as we look around, we can see the evidence of vertical tectonics. Like in the Grand Canyon, there's a sandstone layer that comes along like this. And then you see it goes vertical, goes straight up, and then it goes horizontal again. These, these uh, layers do these bends, and uh, that's showing us the upheavals that occurred. We've, we've talked about tectonics. Now let's talk about volcanoes and magma that's, that's down there in the earth. There was a lot of magma or molten rock that was resident in the, uh, the mantle and the crust of the earth, and it's worked its way up to the surface, and of course we have a, a wide variety of volcanoes. And uh, we have uh, small, uh, normal, uh, uh, stratovolcanoes, we ha uh, like composite volcanoes, we have uh, giant volcanoes like caldera eruptions, we have uh, dikes, we have uh, underground structures where molten material has been intruded to form uh, a, a variety, of, variety of things, dikes and sills. And so this is the world, uh, the volcanic world we live in. And uh, we see uh, these features all around us. For example, looking down on the Andes Mountains in Chile, we see uh, a large mass of, of molten rock that uh, has cooled to make the rock called granite. And this uh, granite is very, uh, very obvious in mountain ranges all around us. And so magmas have moved in uh, under mountains and squeezed up in, into making mountains. And uh, when magma breaks the surface of the earth, of course, it makes big volcanoes. Uh, Yellowstone is a giant supervolcano. I can draw roughly the outline of the collapse feature, but uh, there's this enormous uh, feature that comes around like this, an elliptical depression, something like uh, 45 miles long, something like wow. that. Uh, it is a huge depression and most of Yellowstone, or half of Yellowstone National Park, is this giant collapse feature from the explosion of the volcano. So imagine the volcano was sitting here with a giant magma body underneath it. It, ex uh, it was exploded along a ring, and there was an elliptical uh, curtain of, uh, of magma that was ejected as, uh, as a supervolcano unzipped, and this thing collapsed into the hole. Uh, perhaps uh, hundreds of cubic miles of magma was ejected in a single uh, volcanic event. So there's nothing like that type of volcano today. And so we're, we're looking at super volcanoes at, in the past and we're talking about normal volcanoes in the present. So Yellowstone is a, a gigantic uh, a volcanic collapse feature from a super volcano. And as we look around, we see the volcanic ash deposits from the super volcanoes. Like here in uh, eastern Oregon, you can see uh, the, the volcanic ash beds, and you can see lava flow layers thousands of feet thick. So uh, lava floods and uh, giant explosive volcanic eruptions subsided to make the present. And uh, river deltas. River deltas are interesting. This is the Nile River Delta from space, and you can see where the Nile River comes down and into the Mediterranean. And uh, the, this delta has uh, formed largely since the, the catastrophic plate tectonics associated with the flood. Now, geologists are very interested in river deltas and what goes on underneath river deltas because they can be prospected for oil. 
And uh, uh -huh. here is a, a kind of a profile that was made through the Mississippi River Delta. And you can see the, the very thick strata layers that are down there, oh, maybe uh, five or 10,000 feet down. And so the, the Mississippi River Delta is very deep. And uh, a lot of material washed out there. And then it's, then it, it's kind of slowed down to the present Mississippi River. And so uh, large quantities of sediment, especially in deltas, were deposited in the post-flood period after catastrophic plate tectonics associated with continental sprint. So we have um, uh, large amounts of sedimentation and we have large amounts of erosion. This is a canyon called Palouse River Gorge in southeastern Washington state. Palouse River Gorge has the Palouse River flowing through it. This gorge is about six miles long, several hundred feet wide, 400 feet deep. And it was eroded, we believe, by a gigantic glacier lake that breached its dam and flooded through here. A super flood or a mega flood came down through here and uh, eroded a, uh, a waterfall and the waterfall cut back through and made this canyon. Uh, catastrophic water flooding is one of the major causes for, grand, for canyons like this. Even Grand Canyon, other canyons can be explained this way. Uh, grand Canyon is four to 18 miles wide, a mile deep, and what, 260 miles long. And off to the eastern side of Grand Canyon is evidence of a lake over here, uh, a big lake. It's been called Hopi Lake and it's about 6,000 feet elevation up against the, the, the uh, elevated terrain in the north rim of Grand Canyon, which is about seven or 8,000 feet above sea level. So a lake associated with a, an upwarp structure suggesting that Grand Canyon is a breach dam. Most people have junked the idea that Colorado River cut Grand Canyon. Most geologists uh, recognize there's not a, a an evidence of a through flowing river for 100 million years by looking off for the delta for it. It doesn't exist out there. Instead, we got to explain it by some type of catastrophic event. And so in the post flood period, there were big lakes. These big lakes drained and they created the river systems like the Colorado River. Here's a, a model uh, how the Colorado River could have been positioned through the Kaibab upwarp to form the Grand Canyon. You see the Kaibab upwarp uh, looking a little bit to the east. You see uh, Hopi Lake at about 6,000 feet elevation. The lake is up against the upwarp and probably failed by water flowing through the dam and the dam collapsing. But it's a collapsed dam that notched the spillway through the Kaibab upwarp. And that, when that dam failed, then the next dam and the next lake, Canyonlands area up in Utah, that uh, that dam failed, and so uh, a series or a multiple it's like domino dams. effect. A domino effect and, and then, of failed lakes. Uh huh. And that just kept the erosion going. Yeah. And made it happen. Okay. And so uh, the Colorado River is trapped in the canyon formed by the drainage of the lakes. That's an interesting way to think. Yes, sir. And post flood climate, the evidence of exponential cooling of the oceans. Let's talk about the leftover heat from the global flood and all that tectonics on the seafloor. That heat that created the, uh, the new ocean crust uh, on the, essentially the, uh, a large part of the planet, 70% of the planet was resurfaced. The energy that was released from the formation of that new ocean floor had to go through the, uh, the atmosphere eventually. And so it's caused uh, the cooling. What are the two things you need to have an ice age? Huh. You need cold, of course. To make ice, but, but you also need heat, don't you? You need heat to make an ice age, to evaporate water, to make snow, to be ice. So a rapid post-flood climate change and the exponential cooling could create the, the ice age. Increased rain and snow just after the flood because of the increased evaporation, because of the, of, the, of the hot oceans to start with. The oceans are going to cool. And then the onset of glaciation. So it can explain a number of things. And then, of course, we lead to the present Earth, which is increased aridity. We have big deserts today, centuries after the flood. 
So the post-flood climate has been uh, radically altered by going from the, the uh, po uh, immediate post-flood world with the hot ocean to the present uh, uh, the Temperature climate. of the ocean changed, has changed a lot of things on the Earth. It did. And the cooling of the ocean generated a rapid post-flood ice age. Uh -huh. Here's a, 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 a model uh, of data that suggests the Arctic Ocean cooled from maybe 20 degrees centigrade to essentially freezing today. Okay, and if that happened, um, yeah, that is, uh, that, that's a remarkable cooling. A whole ocean essentially cooled off by 20 degrees. That, w that would create uh, uh, wild weather. We're, we're thinking about increased precipitation after the flood. And here's a, a, a model that's been made. Here you see the continents, North America, South America. There's Asia over there and Europe. And uh, uh, as we begin with that situation and allow the earth to cool with a hot ocean, it leads to increased precipitation. And you can see high areas of precipitation, like up in the polar areas uh, and along uh, Greenland and across uh, some parts of Asia. And that could lead the rain, of course, leading eventually to snow. So we can imagine the global circulation at Ice Age max. But when the Ice Age and Ice Sheet was, was fully formed, uh, there was ice over a large part of Canada, large part of uh, northeastern United States, and uh, over Europe and Asia as well. And this uh, transformed the planet. And of course, these big glaciers uh, left their imprint. Um, even uh, Yosemite Valley uh, in California is, it was a giant glacier that came down through this valley, cut the, uh, cut the granite and made the U-shaped valley. Tremendous force in those glaciers. And those glaciers are, are, are powerful post-flood erosion agents. Yeah. And then I like to think of the blast zone at Mount St. Helens and all the new organisms that are out there. But uh, uh, think about the, the animals and plants after the flood. They've got to distribute widely. And uh, organisms are rather um, versatile at adapting to new habitats. And so here's the elk at the blast zone at Mount St. Helens having a wonderful time uh, eating the grass out there in that uh, formerly d uh, devastated uh, area by the explosion of Mount St. Helens in 1980. It's good to the, see it's back. Yeah, and the elk and the plants and everything are back and the ecosystem is recovered. Yeah. And so you imagine what was happening after Noah's flood. And then I think of the deserts today. We have modern big, big deserts like the Sahara, for example. But the Sahara underneath it has a lake. So a lake was transformed into one of the biggest deserts on Earth. That's, uh, that, that's amazing. So the worldwide global climate change and uh, the, 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 the formation of uh, the arid deserts like in the southwest United States with the rather small Colorado River sitting there in it. Well, we got to uh, take a break and then we'll come to these conclusions. But uh, certainly when the flood was over, it wasn't really over. There was a whole lot of things still happening. And uh, we've been looking at the effect of those and, uh, and, and where we are today. So we want to wrap this up. We want to uh, put some uh, application to uh, what you've shared with us. But before we do that, we have to take a break. Don't you go away. We'll be right back. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Steve Austin, is a field research geologist with his PhD in sedimentary geology. He is senior research scientist with the Institute for Creation Research. He has been involved in geologic exploration for 40 years on six of the seven continents of the world. Steve has also done extensive field research at the Grand Canyon and Mount St. Helens. He is the author of several books, videos, and more than 30 technical geology papers. One of his books, Footprints in the Ash, deals with the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Dr. Austin can be reached at Institute for Creation Research, 1806 Royal Lane, Dallas, Texas, 75229. We're back with Dr. Steve Austin. 
Dr. Austin, this is the wrapping up of three shows on Continental Sprint. And, uh, you know, I've learned uh, so much, and it makes sense out of so many things. Can you kind of wrap it together and just kind of give us a list of, of things that make more sense, things that uh, kind of uh, come into light when we uh, understand uh, what was going on? We've been talking about how the Earth's surface has been deformed, how uh, continents and ocean basins formed. We've been talking about what happened to the ocean during catastrophic plate tectonics, during this time of continental sprint, if you will. It is amazing to think about all the things that continental sprint and this idea of catastrophic plate tectonics, what it integrates. And so I've made a kind of a list of uh, the model with explanatory power, catastrophic plate tectonics. I put some things on the, uh, on the on, on the list here, mechanism, uh, focal earthquakes, the earthquake focal mechanisms, earthquake distribution in the world, uh, they're explained by catastrophic plate tectonics and normal plate tectonics as well. Uh, the way faults uh, and, and uh, faults move things, the thrust and detachment mechanism, better, better explained by catastrophic plate tectonics. Uh, the, uh, the, the way the magnetic field reads in the earth uh, and, and in lava flows and the magnetic striping on the seafloor and uh, the magnetic reversals that are found, uh, evidence that is found in the rocks argue that there was a rapid reversal of the earth's magnetic field. Uh, the, um, just the, uh, the continent sh shapes and how they fit together and the ocean bottom topography and the ridges parallel to the continental uh, um, margins and um, things about the composition of the mantle. All of that um, makes a very uh, cogent argument for rapid tectonics. We see a high and low pressure temperature minerals that argue uh, for high pressure during impact, even melted rock. Uh, and uh, the way that the earth changed after the global flood and uh, the leftover heat, how it modified the climate is very important. And so uh, just, uh, just the way climate changed and the way uh, deposition occurred after the flood, thick wedges of deposits and, and big uh, river deltas, and of course uh, volcanic eruption deposits like uh, uh, lava flood layers uh, like the Columbia River basalts in the northeastern, northwestern United States and uh, the way diamond bearing uh, kimberlites are formed. And uh, just uh, a number of biblical issues like uh, the, wh where the waters of the flood went to, what's the fountains of the deep, a number of questions like this uh, 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 tell us that continental uh, sprint and catastrophic plate tectonics are very strong uh, explanation that has a lot of explanatory power. It, it, it's quite a list you've got there. And uh, it's uh, amazing to me when I read the story of Noah's flood in the Bible to think of all the science that's beneath the surface of that story uh, and what was going on on the earth and under the earth at that time. Uh, but it all makes sense when you put it together and uh, talk to us and we come up with a list like that of things that make sense when we understand the science behind the story of the flood. That's an incredible list. You have done us a great service. Thank you so much, my friend. It's been a joy being with you looking at Continental Sprint. I'll never read the story of Noah again the same. Uh, there are so many images and pictures and knowledge that you've added to, uh, to my repertoire. I'm very grateful. You know, God's word's true. And the more we look into science, the more we discover the truth of God's Word. And we are so blessed as a church to have men like Dr. Steve Austin who help make sense of the science that validates the Word of God. Remember this, my friend, it's God's view that He created you. That should be your worldview too. Hope to see you again here soon on Origins. Until then, God bless you, my friend. Thank you, sir.
Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. To get a copy of the information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 1116 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1116, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.